our scripture for this teaching is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 30 to 33, and it includes what is known universally as the golden rule. Let me read them. The Lord Jesus says, Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. From that we get the phrase, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Verse 32 and 33. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. So that's our text. I'd like to title this, Users are Losers and Lovers are Givers. Users are Losers and Lovers are Givers. Uh, and I'm specifically targeting Christians, talking to Christians in the church, but this can also be applied universally. So let me begin by saying, what do most people come to church for? If you were asked as you were entering church on a Sunday morning, church service, what have you come here to get? I was asked this question when I was in my early 20s by two Bible college students doing a survey. I had just come and got off my motorcycle, helmet in hand, and they said, sir, we're doing a survey. Quick, one question, what do you come here to get? And I stopped immediately in my tracks and said, I don't come here to get. I come here to give. And they furiously wrote that down. I, I don't mean to, to sound immodest to brag, but this was from my heart, even in my early 20s. I don't come here to get, I come here to give. We bring the sacrifice of praise for the house of the Lord. Oh, praise God. So, they were like really blessed by that. So listen to the statement. A giving church is a growing church. Is a growing, glowing, flowing church. That's a giving church. Some people, I teasingly say, even those who come to the church, some of them, what's your name? My name is Jimmy. Jimmy. And you know what that means? Gimme, gimme, gimme. Come to get favors. Come to get blessings. Is that all we come to the house of the Lord for fellowship, corporate fellowship, to get it is shameful to take everything and give nothing. We need to come to bring the sacrifice of praise. Many people, now here's many ways that we, I want us to be challenged if we are users in these ways. Number one, many people use their homes. Young people, listen up. College age, high school, college age, post-college, when you start your job. Young people, singles, sometimes even husbands. We have our jobs, we work, we get our salary, our pay, and we come here and instead of the house being a home, a home, home is where the heart is. Instead, we have become like borders, just live in, come to hit the sack, to sleep at night, and give some money for our room and board. That's the attitude of a user. And remember we started by saying users are losers. We, are to, we ought to contribute to, not keep taking from all the time. Many others use their friends. Yes, we are sometimes guilty of using our friends. We may not Certain people, we may not hear from them for ages. Not an email or, or whatever type of social media you use uh, or a call, nothing. And suddenly you hear from them and you wonder, uh-oh, what's up? Must be that they want something. I pray we have not operated in such a manner. Or if we have been in the habit of doing so, we need to let the Holy Spirit change us. Don't use our friends. We, uh, I like the way someone put it, we are not to be fair-weather friends. We are not to be fair-weather friends. 
Someone said, we are not called to be weather Christians. We are called to be Christians, whether or not. Just a nice little play on words there. The scripture says, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. May we be that kind of friend. Others, so some of us tend to use the homes. Some others use our friends. Some others use the church. We have an expectation because I'm attending this church or I come occasionally. I did my membership course. I've got my certificate. So I expect my babies to be dedicated. I expect to be baptized or the baby, whatever, baptized in water. Uh, I expect my marriage ceremony to be conducted in the church by the minister. I expect hospital visitation when it's needed. I even expect after I'm dead that my funeral service will be conducted by the local church and the minister here. And yet, as far as Sunday morning service attendance, we are not faithful. It's off and on. Wednesday night Bible study, oh, I'm too busy to come midweek. I'm too tired after work. Home cell groups or fellowship groups, house churches, we don't even know whose house is nearest to us from the church as a home fellowship group. Bible study and prayer. What's that? There's no way I could do something like that. I am too busy. Sometimes with the home cell groups, we don't even know whose house it is. Our attitude is the church is here to serve me. Excuse me, who or what is the church by definition? If I am a child of the Most High God, I am a part of the church. We are living stones. So watch our attitude. You and I are the church. We are called to give and serve the unsaved, the world, and each other too. How, is the, how are the unsaved going to come to know Christ if we are not there to love on them and to serve them and to pray for them and to bless them? Others use the pastor, the minister. We expect, we have expectation levels, oh yes, for the minister that he should be prayed up and should even be praying for us that he should preach great sermons, he should have studied the word, he should have been prepared well, he should even be dressed well on Sunday, or else we will criticize that. And then we expect that the pastor should only encourage us, not challenge us in the slightest way. Just for the record, Psalm 23 verse, uh, uh, what, uh, I think it's in verse 3, in Psalm 23, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. How does a rod comfort you? In other words, we need a good wallop once in a while to straighten us out. No, the pastor should only encourage me. Dare he say anything that, that challenges me in my walk, in my life, in my testimony? My nose is out of joint. I'm out of this church. I'm going to the next church down the street. That's using the pastor. We only want encouragement and we expect the pastor should never make a single mistake. He's got to live a perfect life and he's always got to be there when we need him. If I happen to stop by the pastor's house, I expect they should invite me to join them over a meal. Here's what I would suggest instead. We need to pray for the pastor. We can organize to paint his house, do spring cleaning, wash the windows down, wash his car while you're at it, fill it up with gasoline or petroleum too. Mow his lawn. Invite him and his family over for dinner instead of constantly plonking ourselves in his house. Bless him with extra financial gifts. Look at it as giving him a bonus over and above his paycheck. You know when the English word parsimonious comes from it means very little parsimonious comes from the word parson parson 
a modern day word for pastor, minister of the gospel. That's not giving us as Christian believers, as church attenders, a lot of credit, is it? It's telling us that we don't take proper care of our ministers and pastors. Bless them with a bonus also. Put it in an envelope and say, Pastor, this is for you and your family. Thank you for serving us, my family, all the families in this church, and the local community. Thank you for being there for us, for serving us, for praying for us, for blessing us. And all the pastors are saying, Amen! Preach it, Brother Andrew! We are even guilty of using God. How you say? Many times our prayers are demands. God, you said it in your word. You are duty bound to fulfill your word. Dear friend, God can, will never change his word. He cannot change in himself. There's no shadow of turning with God. But hear me now. God, the living God, the one true God, he takes orders from no one. Let me help bring this home. I have but one child, a son. I mean, he's grown now, 25. But when he was younger, if he came to me or his mom and said, Dad, you must do this for me. I am your son, Dad. You, you must, you owe it to me. I like the way one Christian artist once said, he said, my mother said to me, I brought you into this world and I'll take you out of it. In other words, kiddo, don't you dare talk to your dad or mom like that. You need to know your place and speak to me with respect. Oh, dear friend, could we come with penitent hearts? David writes and says, Oh God, a broken and a contrite heart, I know you will not despise. Be very careful with your attitude. Say, God, you said it. You are duty bound. I'm expecting you to do it. I was one time before preaching at a church. And hear the end of the story. The minister, the pastor called me into a side room with the worship team. He said, may we please join hands and pray, which is a great thing to do. And in his prayer, and I'm going to quote verbatim now. He said, and Lord, we make a demand upon your anointing on Brother Andrew's life. He thought it was super spiritual. Me as a guest speaker, I was cringing on the inside. I'm like, oh God, please anoint my lips, my mind, my heart, my tongue. He was making a demand of God. Listen, dear friend, God is not some universal bellhop. Or a genie that, genie that came out of a lamp that you rubbed. You know what happened to that minister? He fell later on and the entire church was shut down. We don't have time to go into details and this is not what that's about. Be careful we do not make demands of God. Be careful we don't pray manipulative prayers. Over people. Over our loved ones over others. Remember who's in charge. God is in control. Who knows better? God knows best. Let's give and bring to God a heart full of love. If we can do that, then service to him and devotion to him and to his body will automatically flow out from us. We need, instead of making these outrageous demands, come with a holy fear. That's an awe and reverence before our God. The Lord Jesus says, don't fear him who can kill your body, but him who can destroy both body and soul. We need that fear of God, an awesome awe and dread in his presence. I'd like to close with this scripture, Matthew 22 verse 37, where the Lord Jesus said when he was asked about the greatest commandment, 
You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. Remember, users are losers, but lovers are givers, and givers are winners. God bless you.